Welcome to World at Work TV. I'm Allison Avalos, and I'm joined today by Steve Wendell from Hello Wallet, and we're talking about behavioral economics. Steve, start off by explaining what behavioral economics is for us. Yes, of course. Behavioral economics is a way to study how we all make decisions in our daily lives. The, the quirks of the mind, and why when there's something that seems to be clearly in our interest, like saving for retirement, why we, we fail to do that. Why there's this gap between intention and action. Behavioral economics looks particularly at the role of the environment. So the role of our friends, the role of small frictions in our lives, like the number of pages we have, to, uh, we have to fill out before we sign up for a benefits program, and how these small frictions can so radically affect our behavior. So what does this mean for total rewards? You mentioned employee benefits and some of the decisions that come into play for employees. Can you elaborate on that a little bit? Behavioral economics has a lot to add for uh, the total rewards practitioner. You can think of it really in two areas. First are the, are the research lessons that we've already found. So for example, people are very loss adverse. In other words, you will fight to keep something you have much more than you will struggle to gain the same thing. And so, for example, if you frame the, the loss of money that you're, that you're facing if you don't take the match. And beyond loss aversion, you can think of other examples. So 401k defaults came right out of behavioral economics and was pushed by behavioral scientists to help people save for retirement, where everybody can choose whether or not they want to save. But the default is yes, because on survey after survey, most people say that they want to save for retirement and they really want something to help them get ahead and prepare for this. But yet, without behavioral economic tools, so many people falter. In fact, the majority of people won't sign up despite the fact that they say they want to. So how can organizations use what they know about behavioral economics to better communicate to employees to help them make better decisions? Sure. So there are, there are a variety of ways that we, can, that we can use these techniques. So first and foremost is, of course, using the particular lessons. So reframing a benefits communication to best appeal to the, to the needs and interests of our, of our employees. So for example, um, talking about instead of uh, for an HSA, we all know the tax benefits, right? Problem is, we still keep on pushing the tax benefits in our communications and say, great benefits, great benefits, great benefits, but yet, okay, we know that. There's no added value. But if you look at the behavioral economic literature, it can show you, well, what are the obstacles that an employee might actually face? Are they problems of anxiety, right? Are they afraid that they won't have the money available for, for medical emergency? They won't have that liquid money. They won't know how to use it. Or is it is a logistical problem? In other words, they're not sure how to sign up. Is it a problem of attention? I mean, yeah, they really wanted to do it, but, they, but people keep on forgetting. Is it a problem of urgency? Uh, retirement is, is, is the greatest example here, where retirement is always important and never urgent, right? It's one of those things that you can always do tomorrow, and then when tomorrow comes, you can put it off later. And we have, busy, we have busy jobs and busy lives. There's so many other things that we need to do with our lives. And so behavioral economics can help us with each of those obstacles, whether they be problems of urgency, whether they be problems of inattention, whether they be problems of motivation, et cetera. And there are tools for each of those. Urgency, there are ways to, um, well, of course, creating deadlines, but also setting a particular expectation. Hey, this is, the, this is the day to complete it. Problems of inattention. Numerous research studies have shown how effective just simple basic reminders are. Not yelling at people, not telling them, hey, you're bad, you haven't signed up for your program, but rather, eh, we know everyone's busy. Have you, you know, here's a good time to do this. The second way that behavioral economics can really help is not the sexy research lessons. It's not books like uh, Predictably Irrational by Dan Ariely or Nudge by, by Thaler. Those talk about things like loss aversion, peer comparison, et cetera, the things I just, I just mentioned. The second area is much less sexy, but also quite powerful, which is the research methods. Honestly, it's a way that we can find the obstacles that, that our employees face and how to help them overcome them in our own very particular circumstances. It's a simple, straightforward method for identifying an obstacle, finding the right tool, and then testing it in the field. Steve, I hear you talking about the opportunity to help an employee understand what they might gain or lose with a specific decision. 
But does the organization run the risk of being sort of threatening or negative if they do that? And sure. is there an opportunity to maybe flip that around to help the employee better understand what might actually be motivating their decision in an effort to ultimately help them make the best decision for them and their families? Of course, of course. So it helps to think that in most cases, the reasons why there's this gap between intention and action, why, and we say employees, but really we mean all of us, right? Why all of us struggle to act when we want to, right? Why we don't actually take action. It's often not about costs and benefits. I mentioned loss aversion, that's one good example of framing, but most of the behavioral techniques we have have nothing to do with the motivation to sign up for a gym program or the cost, say your knees hurt, whatever it is. Instead, it's about hmm, maybe just simple inattention. Maybe it's urgency. Maybe it's a problem of procrastination, right? And so we look for ways that when the costs and benefits are already aligned, how do we help people take action? When, they're always, when it's already in people's interest. And so it isn't yelling at people about the, about the benefits, or for that matter, about the costs and saying, hey, this isn't really as bad as you think. That, that, that often turns out quite negative. Instead, we look at ways to facilitate action. We look at ways to smooth the path. Uh, the famous uh, behavioral economist, Dan Ariely, says, removing all of the frictions in the path so that you have a clear channel for action. That may be reducing the number of pages required for, uh, for enrollment. It may be that when you announce a program, someone can immediately take action. It's not, hey, you have to uh, next week go to this person, talk to him, fill out this form. No, no, no. Right now, click this button, fill out one form, and you're done. That's all about removing frictions to action. This makes a lot of sense, Steve. What advice would you give to Total Rewards professionals to help them influence employee decision making? Okay, sure. First and foremost, find the obstacle. First and foremost, if you have a particular benefits program that's not being utilized, and, and, and people seem like they want it, right? It's not something that you're forcing on folks. If there's a benefits program that people want but aren't using, find out why. And now that we have to be a little careful, though. That doesn't mean necessarily surveying them. Because if you survey folks, almost always you say, Hey, would you like A, B, or C? Yes, I would like all of them. Of course, that's human nature. Instead, we want to observe folks in action. If it's an open enrollment time, sit there where, where workers are actually filling out their open enrollment forms and see where they struggle. See where your forms, where the things that we develop aren't clear, right? So put away our assumptions and just watch and talk to people and see where they really struggle. Because as, as I mentioned, the tools of behavioral economics are not a magic wand that you can wave that will solve any, any benefits problem. Instead, it's a way to find the obstacle and fix it, right? We do have a lot of techniques that can help, but we have to know what the problem is first. So that's, that's uh, one, one recommendation I would make is always look for the particular obstacle. The second is, is quite different. When working with internal programs and working with vendors, when working with partners, we can use the methods of behavioral economics to, well, put it frankly, keep our partners honest. Look for the strong evidence that shows whether a program is effective or not. And this is a, a key lesson from the behavioral economics literature, is that there are so many things going on with our daily behavior. So many things going on when someone is, say, you've got a wellness program, and you know that there's, there's problems of increasing uh, obesity, increasing diabetes within a population. And so you have this wellness program and things seem to go down a little bit. But is that because of the program? Or is it because it's summer and people are exercising more, right? What else is going on? In behavior economics, we have the tools to push aside all those other things and see what's really going on. And especially we look for what are known as A-B tests or experiments or randomized control trials. Now, it doesn't take a lot of expertise. It's something that actually any benefits practitioner can do, and actually I, I write about this quite a lot, the simple steps you can do to, to really get a causal impact. We've talked a lot about employee benefits, and you've mentioned mm -hmm. working with vendors and right. partners, which we know employee benefits professionals do quite often. Mm -hmm. How can those professionals leverage that partner to sure. take advantage of what they know of behavioral economics? Yeah, Total Rewards practitioners are in a wonderful position 
to leverage their role and ensure that their, their employees, their workers, are getting the best out of their programs. Now, that starts with the power of the purse. Let's, let's be frank. It starts with the fact that the Total Rewards practitioners are paying for these programs and have a field of options to choose from. As I mentioned before, one thing to really look for is what's the evidence of the program before you buy it, before you partner with somebody. What's the evidence that the program really works? Again, works above and beyond what people would already have done, right? How do we see experiments? How do we see solid evidence that, hey, you've done something special and different? Or else, sorry, we can't pay for that right now. Or another option is, maybe if folks haven't, don't have that evidence right now, Total Rewards practitioners can partner with their partners, their vendors, even their internal programs that are developing these, to understand what are the real needs and the obstacles that, that employees face and the behavioral techniques. Now, I, myself, I talk about these techniques in, in two books that I've written. And I'm happy to, happy to in fact, share this with anyone, uh, share, share the draft of the second one with anyone from this, uh, from this interview who's, in, who's interested. I talk about how do you run experiments, how do you talk with uh, vendors and partners about their, about their work and piece out what's going on? But also, how do you partner with them? How do you partner with them to, to find the obstacles and help employees overcome them? What a fascinating conversation, Steve. Thanks for sharing your expertise. Sure. For World at Work TV, I'm Allison Avalos.